Hi everyone and thank you so much for the wait. Sorry that we had a bit of a mix up with technology but we're finally here is absolutely going to be making it worth your wait. Uh, we're going old school today, so here is my fabulous monitor, uh, just because we're having a bit of issues with live streaming, but don't worry, it should still be worthwhile. So thank you again for coming to Twinkle Twinkle Baby Black Hole. Uh, my name is Kat Ross and I am a physicist in preparation. I am hoping to become a doctor someday soon, currently doing my PhD in physics with uh, ICRA here in Perth at Curtin University. So I've actually had a long journey getting into astronomy and into physics, and it actually all started when I was really young. Uh, growing up, my family really built on the idea of a mystery and understanding our universe. And it turns out that when we look to the sky, everything that we see, all of the stars, the galaxies, planets, you and I, everything that we see, all of the stars, galaxies, everything that we see, is made up entirely of matter, and that makes up just 4% of the universe, just 4%. Turns out that the other 96% is a mystery. We don't really know what's going on, absolute mystery, and it's a big part of what we're trying to figure out. So growing up, I love this idea, and when we look out to space, there's so much to see. So when I grew up, my family used to take us outside, here's me, little baby cat. Uh, we used to go outside into the street and look up and see the International Space Station. And we used to love the idea that there was just this feat of engineering, this giant monster the size of a football field floating up in space. Uh, it just seems like the peak of human endeavor. And then my parents told me that uh, people actually live inside this and they stay there all the time. So I no longer saw this as a feat of engineering. It turns out what I saw was actually a giant toilet. And I was forever scared that there was just going to be full poop from above. So thankfully, I have grown somewhat since those days. Here I am today, I'm still a PhD student at ICRA. I'm also what I like to call the mother of baby black holes. And I'll get into why that is during this talk. And I'm also gonna say right off the bat, I still froth a good mystery. I love something that we don't understand. I love looking to our universe and seeing something that doesn't make sense. And that's really what science is about, is understanding why things are the way that they are and trying to figure out what's happening. And I love this because there's so many ways that we can do this. So tonight, if you look up in the sky and we look up with our telescopes, we can see galaxies. Now these galaxies is taken with an optical telescope and that means that we're looking with the light that you can see with our eyes. So all the light that we take in with our eyes is the same image that we would see here if only our eyes were as big as a several metre wide telescope. Unfortunately, they're not. But you know, maybe evolution will be on our side. So this is the same sort of view that we would get with optical, but it turns out there's actually a lot more out there. There's so many other ways that we can view this one galaxy. There is optical, but there's also gamma, microwave research. We really focus on this one down the bottom here. And it turns out when we go back to Centaurus A, it now has a really different view. So here it is in optical again, but when we switch to radio, we see these giant lobes and jets coming out from the central region, which is just pretty amazing. It's all of this stuff that's completely invisible to us unless we see it with a radio telescope. Now, all of that is coming from right in the center here, that central region that we call the active galactic nuclei. Now I'm gonna say that again, because it kind of explains exactly what it is. The active, meaning that it is actively making these lobes and pushing matter out into the universe, and it is coming from the nucleus of this galaxy. Turns out astronomers really bad at naming things. We name things exactly what they are. For instance, we were building a pretty large telescope. We're like, oh, a big telescope, what do we call that? Oh, it's really big, I know what we'll call it. We'll call it the Very Large Telescope, or the VLT, which is exactly what this telescope is called. But then what happens when you build a telescope that's even bigger than the VLT? Bit of a nightmare, you've kind of already taken a very large name. You can't have a telescope that's bigger than the very large one. But we overcame that one, we're scientists after all. So we built what's called the 
ELT, Extremely Large Telescope. But again, we're scientists, we like to make things bigger and better every time. So there's a plan for an even larger telescope. So we already have kind of dug this hole. We have the very large telescope, the extremely large telescope. And there was a plan for an overwhelmingly large telescope, but this one actually never got fun. Galaxies right in the center, that is an active galactic nuclei because it's coming from the nucleus of the galaxy and it's actively producing these mushroom clouds. And it turns out if we zoom in as close as we can to this really itty bitty region, right in the center of that galaxy, what we see is actually pretty phenomenal. This may look a little unassuming and it's kind of fuzzy, but this is actually an image of the silhouette of a super massive black hole. Turns out the center of all of these galaxies, as far as we're aware, at the center of every single galaxy is a super massive black hole. And now when gas and dust from the galaxies falling into this black hole, it produces these jets and the radio lobes or these mushroom clouds, and that's what makes an active galaxy. Now this does just look a little bit like a fuzzy donut, but it's actually just over a year old now, and we can still get a whole lot of science from this. In fact, just the fact that it's a different brightness down here compared to the top tells us that this black hole is spinning. That means that the bottom region is spinning towards us, and the top region is spinning away from us, making it fainter. All of this just from an image. Minor problem though, in order to get this, we had to basically use a telescope the size of the Earth, the entire Earth, to create this one little fuzzy donut. Now, obviously there's not actually a telescope the size of the Earth that would be incredibly difficult to build, not to mention incredibly expensive, and no, so scientists don't really have that much money. So instead of building a telescope that's just the size of the Earth, that's really not feasible, we kind of use a clever trick. What we can do is take two smaller telescopes, add 60 meters, they can act the same as a telescope that is 60 meters across. So we don't actually have to build a giant telescope that's 60 meters across, we can just separate little ones. And that means that we can build lots of little ones that is far cheaper than building one ginormous one. And at some point we really can't build telescopes any bigger because the earth is really not gonna let us do that. So at the moment we have this option of a giant telescope where you can chip off the very expensive, very hard work, or you can get lots of itty bitty little telescopes and they can do it for you. Separate them by 600 meters and you effectively have a telescope that's 600 meters across. So that's pretty easy in the sense that we don't have to build a giant telescope, but it does mean we have to build a lot of these little parts to kind of cover as much space as possible. Now, each of these little images is actually what's called an MWA dipole, which is kind of like a little spider looking antenna. And we group all of these antennae together, these little spiders, and we place them out in the desert. And that's what makes what's called the Murchison Widefield Array. Will this load is the question. There we go. Technical difficulties. So, way out in the middle of the desert in WA, it's about nine hours away from Perth. And by definition, we chose this, this is creating radio waves. And it turns out your mobile phone is thousands of times brighter than the brightest radio galaxies, kilometers, which means that we essentially have a telescope the size of a five kilometer dish, which is pretty phenomenal. That's a pretty big telescope. The bigger the telescope is, the more resolution we get, the more detail we can see. So I'm a big fan of your telescope. The better we get the image goes through all these tours at this astronomy web we use later on for the biggest, best telescope in history. So I say that this one is five kilometers across, that'd be great, but it also only has about 4,000 of these individual little spiders, which may seem like a, not, uh, a lot, but imagine if you added more, more until you get to the stage where you basically just have 
an incredible version of the telescope that once operational will create more data than the entire internet in one day. That's what we're currently working on. It's a telescope called this big shout out to astronomy as we're doing at Grand Astronomy in Australia. So we now have a telescope working. What does that mean? Well, if you were to go out into the night sky tonight and look up, you see, you see pretty much this beautiful image of our Milky Way. That is assuming if you're far away from city lights, otherwise you might just see a lot of stars scattering the sky. Now, if you look at every single point, all of those stars, each one of them bar a handful of planets, every single star is a star within our galaxy. Every single point, every little bit of light that you see is a star with our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, that's pretty cool. And we can even see the Milky Way galaxy because right there across the band galaxy, it's all the gas and the dust. And you can see regions in the sky in this Milky Way. What's not actually entirely true, those regions where there isn't much, it's not the absence of stars, it's actually dust and clouds of dust that look like sort of nothing going on, but it's the light that's being blocked by these clouds of dust. So every single dot that we see is a star and we're blocking a lot of the light from the Milky Way. Now, when we look with radio, that's not what we, that's not what we, so now the Milky Way is this long bright strip that we see here and it's kind of hard to see in the, in the stream, apologies, but every single dot in this is actually a galaxy. There's around 300,000 galaxies in this image alone. Now, Natasha Hurley-Walker did a TED talk explaining this image and how we get radio color, because this is actually based on radio colors. I could stare at this image all day. So if we zoom in then a little bright bit in the center, when you look with radio color, which the MWA allows us to do, we can see a little bit more detail as well. We see that across from here to here, from one end of Centaurus A to the other, this ginormous structure is about 2 million light years across. That means to get from one end to the other, it takes light 2 million years. Light is the fastest thing in the universe and it still takes 2 million years to travel across this galaxy. So it's huge. To put it into a bit of perspective, in our own solar system, when you look at the moon, it's actually one light second away. So that means we're looking at it as it was one second ago. Our sun, the nearest star, is eight light minutes. This galaxy is two million light years. Huge. And in radio color, it's also pretty identifiable. We can see in radio red, it's pretty bright. In radio green, not so bright, but then in radio blue, it's quite dim. It gets quite dimmer the, the bluer you get. Now, I've said I'm the mother of baby black holes. That's because I'm more concerned with the ones that aren't quite 2 million light years across. I'm interested in the little baby ones that are only a little bit, two little bubbly things here. But instead of being 2 million light years across, Instead, these ones from end to end are only 30,000 light years across. So they're far smaller, but still 30,000 light years is like, it's pretty big. It's still quite a large thing. Uh, so there's the baby black holes, but realistically, they're still pretty ginormous. What's really interesting about these ones is instead of going bright from radio red down to dim in radio blue, we actually see them go dim in radio red, bright in radio green, and dim in radio blue. They have this kind of peaked shape, and that's why we give them the creative name, peaked spectrum sources, because they are a peaked source. Uh, and that's how we can identify them if we maybe don't get all of this detail of two blobs. We can see the radio colors and find these baby black holes. Now, just a bit of a disclaimer, there is also dead galaxies, so we have these like adult ones, we have the baby ones, maybe even some angsty teens. We also have dead ones like this, but 
I'm going to be honest, I don't really care about the dead ones. I want to focus on cute little babies. So we have these little baby ones. And if they're 30,000 light years across, that means that it takes light 30,000 years to get across one side to the other. And that's what we call the light travel time. It means that if you want to see it vary, you have to watch it for about 30,000 years. Sadly, my PhD is only funded for about three years. I'm not going to have enough time to see that for 30,000 years. So I really don't expect things to change, I guess. Big question. One year time scale. If we're waiting 30 years for something, 30,000 years for something to change, do we expect it to change in just one year? Well, definitely not. No. Uh, that is a big flat out not here. Yeah, is everyone still behaving? Well, it's looking like we've still got ones that show a nice, beautiful peak, and I come back the next year. All good. Everyone's fine, still peaked the next year. But some of them in the first year they were peaked, and then I come back and it's just gone. They're no longer peaked at all. They're kind of just one color, one flat line across all the radio colors. There's no more peak. It's just disappeared. And if I look at some other sources that were originally like the adult sources that looked completely normal. I come back the next year and now they're peaked. And there are also sources that were peaked in the first year and then I come back the next year and they're kind of less so, but still peaked. And what's even more confusing about all of this is that the reverse also happens. I see ones that have gone from peaked to now they look like a natal or ones that weren't really peaked that are now definitely peaked. It seems the universe did not get the memo that things are not meant to change in one year. So that's incredibly weird and confusing. We don't really know why. And that's the whole point of my PhD is to figure out what the hell is happening and try and explain it with physics. So to do that, because I'm wonderful at statistics, I came up with my own statistic called the variability index parameter. That is the VIP of my sources. So I can now find all the sources that are varying heaps and they are my VIP population. Uh, very important sources. And this is actually where you guys come in. So. This is very bright, apologies, but essentially this is your mission. It's a top secret mission. Uh, not really, I talk about it to everyone, but we're gonna try and figure out together what's happening. So suspect number one, this could be caused by maybe some really weird shapes. Maybe the shapes of my black holes are not what we thought. They're not these two bright, lobey mushroom cloud things. Maybe they're actually really weirdly shaped at all and they don't look like what we expect. Or maybe they're what's called a blazer. Now, a blazer is the one time that we kind of got a little bit creative with a name, but it's kind of exactly the same as what a regular radio galaxy is, except instead of having those beautiful lobes that we see and us at them directly on over here and getting that nice perspective, instead, what if we're looking right down the barrel of the gun? What if we're looking right up here at into essentially where the black hole is firing all the matter. That would be incredibly bright. It also means that if any change we're really sensitive to, anything that's changing with the black hole is coming straight at us. So we can really detect that change pretty easily. It's highly variable and can vary on really short time scales. And I don't really know what they do sometimes because they're really odd. So suspect number two, or maybe suspect number three, twinkling. Maybe these galaxies are twinkling just like the stars in our night sky. So when you go out to the sky for a while, you notice that it actually does kind of twinkle a little bit in the sky. That's actually due to the Earth's atmosphere. Now you don't get the high quality details of my drawing from this stream, I apologize, but I assure you it's top quality. So we've got our atmosphere here, and as the light travels down through these stars, through to the atmosphere and us here in Australia, it varies a little bit. It, it's sort of shifted around because of this atmosphere. And we can see that with our eyes. Maybe the exact same thing is happening with our galaxies, but instead of it being in our atmosphere, what if it's the galaxies traveling through our Milky Way down here to get to us? 
And as the light comes through the Milky Way, it's traveling through all the gas and dust in our galaxy, and that's causing them to twinkle the same way that we see stars twinkling at night. Or do you guys think that maybe it's suspect number four, where we have little old me just trying to look at some sky and see some wonderful stuff, but instead I see another giant toilet and there's lots of space poop. Is it space poop, which I will, I admit, be forever terrified about. Now, uh, there is actually a poll on the ICRA Twitter. I uh, can't really see it here, but if you go on Twitter at, at ICRA, I-C-R-A-R, there is a poll. I want you guys to vote. I'm really interested to see which one you think is the cause of this variability. Uh, I am absolutely taking on board all your suggestions. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery. And as far as I'm concerned, this mystery is definitely still unsolved. It is not yet fixed. We're still working on figuring out what's happening. And to sound a bit like a scientist here, we always need more data. We can never have enough data. And I want to look at these black holes for as long as I can and just see what's happening. So that's my PhD. But I do want to go on a little bit to talk about the talk last week from David. Now, David was talking about Pluto, the oddball, the weirdo. Uh, and at the end, he said something that really bored me a little bit. He was talking about how... Pluto is not a planet, and that's really sad. Very sad news. Poor little Pluto. That's a sad face over the top of Pluto, in case you were wondering. Now, I am, uh, I I'm sad hearing this because I am a firm believer that Pluto is not a planet, but that's not a sad thing. I actually think that it's a really positive thing, and it's basically because it's science. We saw Pluto, and when we actually first observed it, it was entirely by chance. We didn't expect it to be there. Well, we were expecting something there, but not what we found. We found this entirely by chance, this incredibly faint, blurry looking thing and realized, oh, it must be another planet and just added it to the list because all the information we had pointed to that direction. But we got better telescopes. We followed up, we looked at it and weren't sure what was happening. So we decided to look at it again and again and get more information, get more data, and we realized that Pluto really doesn't fit in. As the talk last week mentioned, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense about Pluto. And so we decided to change its definition. We realized that not only do we not know about Pluto, but we don't know about our solar system that much. There's a lot of stuff out there that we really don't know about. So when we decided to make the change to Pluto being a dwarf planet, it was because we were making the note that there's a lot we don't know and we should be looking to find more. So it's really just us admitting that there's more out there. And I think that's a really fabulous thing. So thank you again for tuning into the talk. Really glad that there is some questions I see. Please keep coming with the questions either on the YouTube channel or add them on Twitter, uh, wherever it is that you can. I'd love to answer your questions. So the first one I see here is, what is the emission mechanism of the jets, synchrotron or free-free? This is actually a big debate against uh, astronomers here. We're not really sure. So I've seen that sort of beautiful peak where sources go from dim to bright to dim. Well, it turns out that it means something is kind of absorbing the other side. We expect it to follow up like this, but instead we see it drop down. So something is causing that to drop down and observe. And we're really not sure. The two major theories is that it's either synchrotron self-absorption, which occurs when a source is really, really small. So when these black holes are really small and they're emitting that synchrotron radiation, which is causing these big, beautiful lobes, that's the radiation we're seeing with radio. Turns out when we have a really small galaxy, it can kind of absorb its own radiation a bit and cause that turnover and cause it to peak. So that's one theory. Another one that we have is that maybe there's this big cloud of gas and dust that's actually stopping these sources from growing. If that's the case, then these definitely aren't baby black holes. Maybe they're actually angsty teens and they're trying to kind of break free from this cloud, but the cloud is blocking a lot of that radiation and absorbing it. Just like with the Milky Way, those clouds are blocking the optical light from coming through. Uh, I hope that answers your question. My real kind of answer is I'm not sure, but no one is. So that's still an answer. Uh, 
Uh, okay, we've got one from Rami Mandel. So we should adopt this Star Trek model. Planets with classes, e.g. class B, a terrestrial, class C is a gas giant, etc. It's scalable to exoplanets and any new things we can find on this brando. I love that idea. I love that we can change things and adapt things. And as we get more information, maybe we change the classification of Pluto again. I'm not opposed to it. Seems like there is a big following for it, but let's see. Uh, I like the question, Rami. I like your thinking. Uh, so another one is there, is it Quasar scintillation by ISM? So the interstellar medium or ISM is very similar. Yes. So we have this Quasar is essentially what these baby black holes are called. They're really bright and it's essentially just looking at that radio galaxy edge on. And as that light travels through the Milky Way, the interstellar medium, which is that gas and dust in our Milky Way, is causing them to twinkle the same way that our atmosphere causes the twinkling of the stars. So likely by the interstellar medium, we do also see variations that are very similar but caused by the winds from our sun. Now, that happens on much shorter time scales. I'm talking under a second. So I certainly wouldn't expect to be measuring that over a year. But we do see similar kinds of variability in other situations. So it's not unreasonable to say that maybe that's what's been causing this variability we see here. Another question is what happens to both of those questions? Uh, so as the electrons are emitted from this black hole, we have this swirling kind of crazy black hole and all around it is this disk of matter that's falling into it. We call it the accretion disk. And as that matter falls into the black hole, it gets super energetic and we see those sort of lobes shooting out at opposite directions from the black hole itself. Those are the jets and the lobes that happen. And it's emitting those electrons and it actually emits them in a range of different energies. So they can be really high energy electrons and really low energy electrons. Now, as that is sort of those electrons travel away from the black hole, it's no longer getting sort of the energy from that, um, that black hole. So you start to see them fade, except that the black hole then keeps pushing more out. So it's only if you really follow that one individual electron that you start to see it lose its energy. But when that central black hole turns off, if it no longer is pushing more electrons out into the jets and the lobes, then we do start to see them fade. And it actually fades in the bluer colors and takes its time to fade right down through to the red colors. Uh, and that's actually the remnant phase or that dead galaxy that I showed you. And there's a lot of research going on at the moment. In fact, my fellow PhD student is doing research to find these dead galaxies because they can fade fairly quickly on astronomy timescales. They say, don't invite an astronomer to dinner, we'll be there plus or minus 5,000 years. It's pretty similar with the dying phase of a galaxy. It can take millions of years. So it can take a long time, but it does mean that there's a lot of galaxies that are just too faint for us to see anymore because the galaxy center, that active galactic nuclei, has faded until we can't see it anymore. Uh, okay, so another question from Ronnie. How old are these cosmic baby black holes? That's a good question. Uh, and again, a little bit up for debate. Uh, because it depends what's actually causing bait, uh, because it depends what's actually causing them. If they are, in fact, the baby black holes, then we found them to be less than five giga years. So that is five with nine zeros behind it, if I remember correctly. Uh, five with nine zeros years old. So it's still quite old. Uh, so baby. But again, that's, uh, we're talking astronomical timescales, that's actually quite young. On the other hand, there could be those frustrated sources, those angsty teens, in which case maybe they're actually older and they just have been confined to this space and they're not able to grow. They could be a bit older then and maybe actually even with more time, they'll get enough energy to push free from that cloud and extend to a normal size of a galaxy, uh, in which case they might be older. I don't know. It's a bit of a question. Uh, but who knows, maybe Ronnie will do that after their, their current PhD work. Uh, <laughs> okay, question six, another one, we've got Rami again. How do you shield all the electronics, so computers, technology, etc., and RFI generated from them 
at the MRO from interfering with the MWA signal, a giant Faraday cage. <laughs> uh, well, a giant Faraday cage, my thoughts would say that would also block the radiation from the galaxies, which is definitely not what we want. Uh, but what we do is we have a radio quiet zone. So that means if you want to visit the MRO and you want to visit the MWA, you have to turn off all the devices that create RFI. So that means you have to turn your phone off, you can't have computers, you can't have radio, um, as in a, a radio to check in on your on your truck with anyone, um, you can't have Wi-Fi turned on, all of that must be switched off. And there's a lot of really careful electronics to shield all the wires and everything so that we get as minimal interference as possible. We do still get some interference and sometimes it's just too bright, you have to kind of discard the data. And that's annoying and I don't like it, but it's where it's at. Um, noticeably, there are some things that we really can't deal with and that's satellites. Satellites can be a really big emitter of radio waves and even though they're meant to follow really strict guidelines of what radio waves they emit, sometimes they just don't follow that at all and they emit radio waves right through into the MWA frequencies, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, so it's a bit upsetting. There are these, these satellites that will go over in the middle of your observation and kind of ruin everything. But again, uh, there's not much we can do about it other than really cause these kind of laws in space to make sure that people follow them and, and create satellites. Uh, there is actually a giant Faraday cage around the control building, just to be clear. I thought you were talking about a Faraday cage around the telescope itself, which would be a wild idea. But no, a Faraday cage around the building itself, definitely. Because we do have a lot of uh, technology in there that we need to make sure the telescope is performing, but also in case of emergencies, things like that as well. So there is technology that needs to be on the site that does produce radio waves. And so for the next door to actually get in the building, there are these giant, big, heavy doors to try and stop that radio wave uh, passing through and getting to our telescope. So we do as best as we can, but, uh, you know, we're not perfect, unfortunately. And ideally, uh, we could just get everyone to turn off their phones and turn off all technology, but then how would you get this wonderful talk from me? So not worth it. Uh, I have got some intel coming in hot that Space Poop is apparently winning the poll at the moment. So make sure you do head on to Twitter and follow uh, at ICRA, I-C-R-A-R, -R, and vote. I'd love to hear what everyone says from Space Poop, but let's not rule it out uh, too hastily. Uh, another question, do brainwaves of animals and people make RF noise in the signal? So you can actually have, if you put your hand in the middle of the, the sort of viewing area of a telescope, it is also brighter than radio galaxies. So it's a thermal radio energy, and we can see that with radio telescopes but uh, you kind of have to be like right on top of it. The brain waves and the radio heat that we're emitting is not really enough to um, create enough interference. Really our biggest concern is technology, which is kind of like you have this giant of rocks. Uh, let's say, let me grab some things from around my desk. Here we go, maybe a couple of some chocolate wrappers from Easter, don't judge me. So we have this kind of handful of stuff. If I hold this sort of from my height, get behind the screen here and drop it that sound that we heard that gravity that pulled it down all of that energy that is more than all of the energy of radio galaxies ever collected so if we combine all the energy from radio sources all the radio waves we've collected from the universe into one number of just what is the total energy it is less than the amount of energy it took for the earth to pull down that handful of stuff and make the noise. So things are incredibly quiet. Uh, and that's why we really wanna preserve these radio zones as much as possible. And there's a lot of regulations around the MRO that say whether or not you can have certain devices that emit radio waves. Because it may seem like Perth is really far away and it may seem like all the towns around it are also really far away, but they're not far away for radio waves. We can see them. Uh, so, I think if anyone has any last questions, don't fret. I will be on Twitter. I will be answering your questions there and very much following along the poll, following along the poll to see if... So again, make sure that you follow ICRA, I-C-R-A-R, on Twitter. Also myself, Astro underscore Kat Ross, K-A-T-R-O-S-S, um, on Twitter and Instagram. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the talk. Again, apologies for a technological 
issue, but we're scientists. We do the best that we can with what we have, just like our little radio telescopes. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Make sure you tune in for the rest of ICRA's talks that we have going. This should be really fun. Um, I know that I had a great time doing this. I hope you guys did. And uh, have a wonderful time. <laughs>